Following is one of 400 videos for traders and investors. Go to AskSlim.com and sign up for a free account. Follow us on Twitter at AskSlim and subscribe to this YouTube channel. And don't forget, give us a thumbs up. For all of our trials, you can write to Matt at AskSlim.com and request a premium level trial membership. Thank you very much for watching. Style, Strategy, and Plan Trading Poker Comparisons All right, this can be an interesting one. Um, I've been planning to do something like this for a while and kind of waiting for the right uh, day to do it, especially in a market that maybe wasn't moving all that much, so it would be a, a good time to uh, look at something that wasn't really looking at charts that was more talking about trading styles. Uh, most of you know, many of you know, that I love to play poker, um, and I plan on doing that a lot once the day comes down the road that I retire um, from, you know, trading pretty much full time and, you know, doing this every single day with you. Um, I've been playing poker for money since I was about 13 years old. That's 55 years. Wow, almost 55 years. I've been playing at casinos since I was 17. Yeah, I, I've always looked older than my age. I played uh, in the Grand Prix of Poker, in the WSOP, uh, in lots of regional tournaments. I've played thousands and thousands of hours of poker online and countless hundreds of thousands of hands of poker for sure. Uh, and read many books on playing poker. And I've also read countless articles on comparing um, the aspects of being a trader with that of being a poker player. And there are many commonalities between the approaches and the personal traits. So I thought it would be really interesting to go over them, kind of share them, and get some uh, uh, maybe a broader understanding about uh, trading, and I think that there'll be some for some people. Just you know, the the poker references might um, might be interesting also. Uh, I I think there's something in here for all. Um, one of the things that you know prompted me to do this is because I I hear the term pot odds thrown around a lot. Uh, in uh, in reference to the stock market, uh, and I, I when I hear how the term pot odds is being used, um, it's annoying to me. Actually, it pisses me off because it's in, in a way it's kind of sets up novice traders for getting themselves into some trouble because they they really don't understand and the the professional um, traders that throw around the term pot odds I don't think they understand understand that easy so there's there's more on that coming I'm going to talk about that actually in in number seven of seven slides that I'm going to talk about right in here as we look at the similarities between um, trading and poker um, and uh, this I think is going to be well really interesting so let's uh, start out with the first slide and just talk a little bit about um, trading uh, and poker and uh, how they are both approached with a plan so you know when a, a lot a lot of people or most people when they're you know getting into trading they will start out by um, just getting some ge just general basic experience trading in the markets. They might be trading simulation, they might be trading just uh, uh, one or two stocks and just trading a little bit and getting some experience. So a, a lot of people don't start out with a plan, but then eventually they learn that they have to approach the market with a plan. It's surprising how many people I work with or have worked with in the past that that are approaching the market really without a trading plan and that creates a lot of difficulty. There's uh, a, a lot of different things you can put in a plan and I've, I have traders that have one page plan and I have one tr uh, uh, trader uh, hedge fund guy that has a 60 pl page plan so it, it doesn't have to be that involved but 
trading basically it's important to have a very basic plan where you um, have your risk parameters written down the trade size that you're going to take the um, uh, amount of risk per trade the amount of risk uh, uh, in your entire portfolio the the particular size of the bias in your portfolio the amount of capital committed per trade per per um, uh, at, at any one time that you have at risk and overall you know the, pl the plan in there has a good sense of discipline and money management we'll talk a little bit more about discipline also in poker it really is very very much the same um, you're going to uh, you're, you're going to know your risk parameters you're going to know the size of the game that you're going to trade in and the one that is the best for you the amount of uh, of risk that you're going to take in any game that you play in and compare that to the size of your bankroll I don't mean if you're you have a ten thousand dollar poker bankroll it's not that much different than having a ten thousand dollar account maybe you're going to risk three or or five hundred dollars uh, in a particular poker game, just like you might risk three or five hundred dollars in a particular trade. Uh, the so you're you know the percentage of capital you're committing in a trade or in a game, and overall, a good poker player has very good understanding of um, the uh, of of money management. The next thing we're going to talk about is strategic approach and how important that is to both trading and in poker. So in trading, um, it's important to decide your best choice of strategy, strategy overall that you're going to be using or strategies, the trading vehicles that you're going to trade in. Um, you could be an option trader, you could be a futures trader, you could be a stock trader, or you could be a multiple strategy trader. Um, you might be trading as a professional or maybe you're trading as a hobbyist, maybe you're trading part time. Um, there's a lot of different variables to the approach that you're going to choose. A poker player really does the same thing. Um, he may be a Hold'em player or maybe an Omaha player. Uh, he may be only a cash game tournament, a uh, cash game player versus a tournament player. Um, maybe he's really good at multiple games and be playing Hold'em and uh, Omaha and be playing Limit or No Limit and many other things that you know are, are variances in the strategic approach. Uh, and he may be somebody that plays full time and is on the poker circuit, the tournament circuit, or he might be somebody that, like me, kind of plays you know once or twice a week or somebody that's kind of a fun type poker player and uh, then um, you know just playing occasionally and you know you your strategic approaches are going to be very different based on the style of, of trader you are or b based on the style of poker player that you are so you know those are kind of some real basics you're gonna have a plan uh, and um, you're going to do that you best the best you can to follow your plan <clears throat> uh, whether you are uh, a trader or a poker player you're going to evaluate the strategic approaches that there are and you're going to um, choose which ones of those are best for you and uh, what is the best uh, fit to your engagement in the market based on who you are, what your lifestyle is. Uh, you know, for me, you know, poker now is kind of, you know, a fun and challenge thing to do. And maybe when I retire and, and spend a lot more time doing it or play more poker tournaments, it's going to be... Uh, let's say less less of a hobby and less of fun and maybe uh, more important to to what I uh, do overall so it's every uh, every person fits into uh, each of those things in a different way and I bring that up because of how important that is for you to decide as a trader uh, how um, what your engagement is in the market what your strategic choices are going to be what is the best vehicle for you to trade that fits into your personality your market experience your capital 
all of those things. Are you going to be a multiple strategy type trader? Are you going to be a uh, option trader that has a strategic approach and has 30 positions on at once? Or are you the type of trader that fits best into scalping uh, e-mini futures and taking no positions home at all? Uh, do you do this as part-time because you have a full-time job and that's how you earn your money to live in a full-time job? Or is this full-time for you? And uh, therefore, your approach to it is going to be different because um, it will it will probably be important to paying your overall bills. So all of those are really important. And these are really big similarities when I look at the quality of poker players that are out there uh, and the success in poker players. And the same thing for traders, pretty uh, similar traits. We're going to talk about personal traits uh, in just uh, a few moments also. Now, one of the, the next uh, big uh, things we're going to talk about in the next slide is understanding probabilities as a, a key to being success as a trader and as a poker player. So we'll talk more about that. So when you're, uh, you know, if you were an options trader and um, you, you, you know, were deciding what um, trades you want to put on, you're going to be looking at your pop, your probability of profitability in options. It's essentially, you know, your the odds of a trade that you're going to put on. Now, you know, be believing that it's a zero sum game, you know, if you put on something that has a, you know, two to one risk reward or a 66% pop, your odds are that you're going to lose, um, you know, twice as often. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, you're going to win twice as often as you're going to lose, but when you lose, you're going to lose twice as big as you're going to win. So that's kind of zero results. In order to be profitable, you have to figure out ways to, tr to trade that based on other aspects of your analysis uh, and based on market activity, fluctuation, and your ability to read situations that where the results are likely to be outside of the statistics. So that's where you get a statistical edge when you can figure that out. That uh, often occurs uh, when you um, are doing something in far out of the money options, like a far out of the money strangle, where your, you know, your probability of profitability may be four to one, but the pricing uh, of the implied volatility might be well higher than that. So you might be able to get a you know, much better potential return in there. So it's about evaluating the probability of profitability and then evaluating do you actually have an edge in there or is there something, some actions that you can take uh, while you have the position on to um, take advantage of specific market situations that then improve what, a th what the statistics show is your you know odds of being profitable in it. When it comes to um, poker, um, this a lot of this a lot of this is about starting hands. You know what's the quality of the starting hand. Uh, what is the type of betting that I can do to improve that quality uh, of that starting hand? Uh, a, a lot of that is a lot like um, like trading. Uh, in trading, you may look at your uh, the odds of success based on your technical analysis. You know, I basically do that a lot with cycle analysis. It's like the odds of a starting hand in poker. It's also the odds of the number of opponents that you have. Uh, the, the odds of the amount of bet that you're going to put in uh, versus the amount of money that's in the pot. We'll talk more about pot odds coming. Also, your EV or expected value um, that uh, is, is in the pot or the equity that you have based on the hand that you have versus what you can see in the flop or cards that are out there. You have a specific equity based on 
the results of how your holdings interacted with the flop, the, the cards that are coming out. So there's tons of decisions to make and tons of ways for you to evaluate um, probabilities uh, in trading and uh, in poker. And that means that people that spend the time uh, in order to understand that, to have a great understanding of how to get, how to, how to best understand the probabilities, how to best be maneuverable so that you can um, improve that situation based on the you know environment uh, that that you're in the the market environment or the environment of the nature of the table that you're sitting at in poker uh, there's amazing similarities uh, in that uh, so we're talking about you know understanding the probabilities to to success in trading and in poker, a lot of that is also about uh, decision making because in both cases you're really making decisions on incomplete information. You have some of the information or a little tiny piece of the information, but you know you don't know what's going to happen in the market five minutes from now or three days from now. A uh, poker player doesn't know what's coming in the on the turn, which is the fourth card, or at the river, which is the fifth card. Uh, in in the um, uh, common cards that are out there, so so you're acting on complete information, but you still have some sense of the probabilities based on the information that you have. So it means really having a good understanding of what could be coming and how you maneuver your position or how you maneuver your position on the poker table uh, in order to improve that situation. Also, uh, traders that are very successful really understand the the importance of batting average. Now, you know, I talk about batting average uh, a lot, and especially do that in my workshop, Five Essential Building Blocks to Successful Trading, uh, where I talk about the importance of the win-loss percentage. Um, where your your wins should be bigger than the odds would say that your wins should be, or and your losses would be smaller than the odds overall say that your losses should be. Now you don't even when I say that you don't even know whether I'm talking about trading or poker, do you? Because it's exactly the same in both. Being able to uh, uh, make sure that. Um, your trades uh, yield a larger number of wins than losses, or for, for, for option traders, it would be a bigger gain based uh, that, than the probabilities would suggest, or a smaller loss based on what the probabilities would suggest. Again, that would be exactly the same uh, for poker also. So it's really important to be able to have that batting average. And it's, a lot of that has uh, is about your ability to evaluate market conditions. You know, if you're in a condition where you have a specific probability of profitability uh, and the implied volatility is, um, is actually uh, uh, bigger than the true volatility in the market, then the chances are you have an advantageous position on. For a poker player, he's going to be evaluating the condition of the table. If the table is made up of all very aggressive players, with, um, in other words, they're they're putting a lot of money in in weak hands, then it makes it more. It's going to be a volatile table. And it makes it more important to be playing only higher quality hands when you're playing at a table like that. So, um, in other words, they're loose, you tighten up. Uh, the market's loose, well, you get a little tighter because the volatility gets really high. So there's some really important similarities in there when you look at you know evaluating market condition, evaluating the table. Uh, condition. Um, it's, it switches also for tournament play versus uh, cash play uh, in poker, where there are some some differences in there because early in a tournament, uh, the um, play is very different than later in a tournament. Uh, trading around what we call the bubble in a tournament, which is the point where you're, you know, basically just nobody's in the money yet, but when a couple players more are going to 
bust out, then everybody will be in the money. So the play around the bubble is very different. So there are, you know, you tr a trader trades differently and has, when they're really strong, again, we'll talk about that in a, a moment on personal trades, on being able to evaluate market conditions. And, you know, when the opportunities are greater, they're taking, you know, um, advantage of that. When the opportunities are v much smaller, then they're taking far less risk. And uh, that's uh, what a good poker player does also. So that's uh, some really uh, important uh, information also. So, of course, uh, in, um, in trading, everybody talks about how important it is to be disciplined. Discipline is, as I say, probably the most overused and under, uh, least understood word uh, that is used in trading. So uh, this is next one is about... Um, uh, you know, the, the disciplined approach and how that's imperative to uh, success in trading and uh, success in poker. So m what I talk about in, um, in discipline is what I call my uh, six important areas of discipline. And I'm not going to go very deep into them right now, but you can, you know, when you listen to this, you'll really get a sense that, you know, out what's really important to really be on, be on your game. That's kind of the, the uh, a uh, cliche that a lot of people use when they're in talk about getting ready for trading. You know, getting ready, be on your game, right? And once, when you're in poker, it's about being on your game also, certainly. So the, the six areas I'm just going to touch on briefly are uh, your, your, your pre-day prep. I mean, what do you do to get ready? How do you get centered? Uh, how do you get in the right mental space? Uh, before uh, the, your trading day starts or um, before your business day starts so that you can be prepared for giving trading the proper attention and giving um, life or business the proper attention. And it's the same thing for playing in a poker game. It's about, you know, getting the mindset set correctly, you know, knowing how you're going to play in one stage of the game versus another stage of the game, knowing how you're going to approach what you want your mind to be if you get low stacked. And in other words, you've lost some hands, you haven't gotten any cards, and now you're, you know, everybody around you has more money than you and how you're going to get your mind right for the play that you need to do based on how the game has changed. So there's lots of things to do with pre-day prep uh, and a lot of traders don't spend a lot of time on that and that's really important. Uh, the next thing is about focus, distractions, boundary setting. Uh, so many traders, um, they allow themselves to be distracted uh, by life, by things going on, by you know important maybe things that are important that they get called upon to pay attention to. And at the same time, it's important to draw strong boundaries uh, for with other people uh, and with yourself to make sure that you're well focused. A lot of traders that have issues with discipline that lose money, uh, uh, it's kind of a vicious circle. They lose money so they feel pain and then they distract themselves. And because they're distracted, they're out of focus, and they lose more money, and then they feel more pain, and then they go to more distractions. And it's this addictive cycle that goes on. And uh, I'm even guilty of, I've been very guilty of that in my trading past, and I'm even guilty of that sometimes playing poker. Uh, because uh, there's a balance between allowing myself to be distracted, to keep myself calm while things are not going well. And I might do that by, you know, looking at my iPhone, doing something that uh, and the doing something that's a healthy distraction at times or overdoing it and just getting completely taken out of the game which is something that I think that a lot of traders allow themselves to do so there's good focus there's you know a lot allowing limited number of distractions when it's important and the importance of boundary setting uh, creating your study space uh, telling your uh, kids and spouse or significant other what the time is that you're going to spend uh, uh, focusing on trading so that there's no um, 
sense of uh, disappointment uh, either in you yourself or in them everybody has an expectation that's important uh, if you watch my video trader spouse relations uh, I get a lot of compliments on that one uh, in our video library I think that you'll find that to be um, really valuable uh, so it's uh, focus distractions boundary setting that's number two of the discipline uh, next one is research study reading uh, you know it, it takes years and years of study and practice to be a successful trading uh, trader. Uh, I, I was actually one of the lucky ones and I was in a situation in 1974 or 5 where there were a lot of edges and I could turn the corner pretty quickly. It still took me about eight months to turn the corner and to be able to figure out how to become successful. Nowadays it takes much bigger bank rolls. It's a much more difficult situation because you're not trading, you're not making a market that's you know 25 or 50 cents wide you're dealing in marketplaces that are a penny wide in stocks or a tick wide in futures so those edges are gone and it means a means research study trying to figure out the new edge which is basically a momentum edge these days and how to be you know how to be with the market and figure out the best way for you to engage based on who you are. It's constant knowledge building and that means that you have to block out the time. It's the exact same thing for poker players. Uh, really learning the game, understanding the probabilities, learning all of the nuances and multiple player, playing against multiple players or heads up or you know playing uh, weak hands versus strong strong hands and I could go I could name differences for hours uh, that uh, in in potential situations uh, that uh, a trader has to you know be able to handle and a poker player has to be able to handle another important aspect number four is physical care you know uh, uh, and emotional care uh, readiness for the game in other words uh, are you operating on four hours sleep uh, because you have a new baby and you know you're getting up and taking care of the baby which is great uh, and uh, that means that you know your engagement in the market's going to have to reflect what your life is at that time uh, or maybe you've got other issues in your life that are bothering you and you're you know not sleeping well at night and that's making you be have a very difficult time with a good attention span for the market so uh, it's it's physical care it's eating the right food it's getting the right exercise and it's emotional care it's you know what's going on inside of you that you're not attending to that you don't understand that you haven't built the self-awareness for we'll talk more about that and emotional reactions in here but it's about readiness for the game is what it really be the trading game I don't like to use the word game for trading but that's the comparison today uh, or uh, being a poker player the next one is your commitment to your plan uh, it's uh, it's it's about your you know looking at your plan often it's about record keeping and keeping good records and really you do that to know what's wrong how to tweak how to, how to tweak your approach to the market how to tweak your game you know uh, how much money did you make or lose what was it based on what were the what was the um, in market environment at the time were there any unusual situations um, did you take advantage of situations well or did you not what can you but do better these are all kind of things that you would do in a journal that may be part of your pre-day plan uh, that you're working on so um, good poker players do that too they keep records uh, have a good sense of what went right what went wrong how they can improve their game and the next one is accountability now this is a little different in in trading than being a poker player but still it's about the deal that you make with yourself it's about the deal that you make with your partner or significant other it's about you know um, making commitments and sticking to them and when not sticking to them owning up to it uh, whether it be to yourself uh, to your partner having a regular accountability check-in might be with uh, a trader buddy it might be with uh, a, um, uh, uh, a psychologist it might be with uh, somebody in your church it could be any number of people that you would check in with and just be accountable to because then um, when that's the case and things go wrong, there's less chances you're going to just 
you know, kind of look away from them rather than make the proper adjustments and, you know, operate in a place that's really healthy. So that's the discipline approach, and I think imperative to success uh, as uh, we uh, look at, you know, seven different things that, seven different, six different areas that are really important to discipline. The, the next one that we're going to look at in here is the importance of uh, uh, having a strong understanding of our emotional reactions. So when you, whether you're playing poker or whether you're trading, there, is, there are a multitude of times that we can be easily triggered. Now, when we use the word trigger, it means that an event happened and we had an emotional response to it. And that emotional response could be at many different levels, and it could be many different emotions that are coming in, and even to the point where we're so flooded with emotion that we it's very, very difficult to make good, strong decisions at that time. So in, in both uh, poker and uh, in trading, it's just very easy to get triggered. So it's understanding our emotional reactions as there are a multitude of opportunities to make mistakes. It's about accepting that we will make mistakes, that we'll lose money, and that all of those are learning opportunities. In fact, losing money and doing it correctly is such a giant key to being successful in trading. In other words, you have a particular loss parameter and you, you take a loss within that loss parameter, it's within the expectation, then you just move on. It's even something that you can celebrate. You know, I did it right. I lost money and I did it right. And now on to the next one that, you know, I know overall is likely to work for me. That's a real confidence builder when you're able to do that. Uh, and making, you know, really accepting that we will make mistakes and lose money. It's the same thing for playing in poker. There's uh, every single hand has got a particular odd structure to it. And uh, as the hand progresses, those things change significantly. And um, we will, at some point, in a good majority of hands, make the decision that surrendering, and surrendering is a good, solid word. In other words, it's time to give up the hand. The odds are no longer that it's going to work for us based on the amount of money that we have to put in the pot from this moment to the amount of money that I can get returned to me at that moment. It's an amazing, amazing statistical uh, way to uh, approach um, poker in a mechanical way. There's also you know, multitude of other aspects to it of what we understand about our opponents, what we understand about game conditions. But the, um, the truth is, is that if we do, and if we surrender the hand at that moment and say, these odds are not well in our favor, no matter what the result is afterwards, it was the right decision. It's the same thing to accept that we'll lose money because we'll make the right decision to exit a hand, make the right decision to exit a pot. We don't know what's coming. This is the incomplete information, what's going to come after that. But it doesn't matter because simply what we did was say the risk rewards are no longer favorable. So we exit the situation. If we put more money in in that situation, that might be rolling a trade where there's no economic or, or uh, sense to it or no analytical sense to it. It may be putting money in a pot because, oh, well, I got so much money in there already. I'm already losing so much money. I'm just going to see if I can get lucky. I mean, that's a, how a weak poker player would approach that. So you can see that there's a lot of um, strong uh, comparisons in there. Next thing is building emotional muscle. I mean, this is really what I talk about a lot in uh, my workshop, The Five Essential Building Blocks. Uh, and that helps you avoid emotional decisions. In other words, you can fend off the emotional trigger from coming and having you make decisions based on how you feel versus an intellectual process. And that's 
so important uh, in uh, trading and immensely important in poker when people are trading based on emotional uh, conditions, uh, decisions, then they're very likely going to not take losses or they're going to increase losses. When a poker player does it, he goes on tilt is what they say and all of a sudden he's pouring money in on bad hands just to try to feel good when he gets a win even though it's a poor odd situation. So, you know, there's a, a lot of commonality in there and being able to know when your emotions are coming up and then fend them off by learning to do so through processes that I talk about in other videos is really uh, important. Another thing is uh, importance of uh, avoiding victimization. Uh, in uh, trading, in other words, uh, we the market is our enemy. The market did this to us, uh, you know, or um, uh, making yourself the enemy. Oh my God, I did that again. I can't believe I did that again. So it's a it's a either self victimization or victimization from the market, and that brings up the emotions and our decision making is really poor. I see poker players do it against the dealers, and uh, where they they're the victim of the dealer, or they're the victim of the deck, or I mean, the probabilities are there. I mean, it's all statistical information. We're, we do bad in poker. We're a victim only of our own poor play or benefit from our own good play. And uh, in either case, it's important to keep emotions as steady as we can. That's the case uh, in uh, uh, trading also. Avoid that sense of uh, being a uh, victim. Uh, and another, I did a video called uh, Money Versus Process, and that's really an important thing here. Not paying much attention to your money uh, and how much you're making or losing. If it's all within the parameters you design, that's fine. It's much more about the process, how you're going to approach the market, how you're following your plan. Uh, and if you do that, you're going to have a lot easier time um, being at a level mental place. Um, watch that video uh, in the library if you haven't done so. Another thing that I think is really important, and I learned this back when I was uh, in 1976, so I'd only been trading for about a year and a half, uh, where it's important to be um, playing in the right size game. How do you like that? Uh, for, for the poker analogy. And in the trading analogy, it's trading real money versus simulated simulated money trading you know real money versus paper money and playing and trading in this appropriate size so you're basically in a comfort zone but maybe pushing the edge of that comfort zone a little bit so that you're it's it's enough so that you really have to pay attention uh, and it's not so small that the emotional reactions can't come up you cannot become a successful trader when you're trading too small you have to trade big enough for the emotional reactions to come up to deal with the psychological issues that you won't even know about until you're trading with real money or you're trading in a size that's big enough to get them to come up. Uh, my uh, One of my mentors taught me that way back in 76 uh, uh, and really encouraged me to make sure when I was really struggling and got into a bad losing streak uh, that uh, I uh, was not playing in a penny poker game. You put me in a penny poker game, I don't even care. I mean, I'm throwing in money and it makes no sense. You put me in a real poker game that is a limit that pushes my edge, then I'm really paying attention. I'm really using my skills and working to keep my emotional reactions where they should be. So that's the importance of playing in the right size. For those of you that are out there that are trading simulated, and I know that there's a number that watch my shows that do so. Um, uh, it's really important that you move that you you only use simulated trading uh, for the purpose of learning the language of the market. Once you're beyond that, you should go to whatever the minimal next increment is of real money in order to have the psychological reactions that you need to to become successful. So the next thing we're going to look at is uh, the uh, many personal traits uh, that are in common between successful traders and poker players. Now, uh, I did a video on this also. There's little pieces of that taken out of that in this discussion. Uh, and you can go see, uh, go see that in the library also about the uh, personal traits that bring success and challenge for traders. So the first one is uh, that we're going to talk about is uh, 
optimism. Uh, there's uh, traders that uh, are optimistic. They, they believe that they're going to have the next opportunity right in front of them, that they're going to be successful. This is a lot in line with the law of attraction, which I'm going to be doing a video on soon. I, I avoid the woo-woo discussions in law of attraction and much more the scientific the discussions about it. Um, if you if you believe that you're going to be successful, then the actions that you will take will be in alignment with being successful. You create your own reality. So when you're optimistic and you believe that, well, the next opportunity is coming, you're going to take losses appropriately because it doesn't matter because the next opportunity is right down the road. You expect success. It's the same thing for being a poker player. You can give up the crappy hands. You can give up the weak situations because the next opportunity is coming. It's the next hand or the next tournament or the next game, whatever it might be, if you know my loss is within the my design parameters in poker, then I know I can come back for the next game where I have a good probability that I'm gonna do well. Same thing in trading, really important. Another one is high self-esteem. Uh, a good trader really holds on to the confidence in difficult situations, knowing that, uh, man, I'm, you know, I'm in a situation now that's you know, kind of gotten beyond where I wanted it to get. The market environment changed. Everything is difficult. And uh, I, you know, uh, I, I know within myself that uh, if no matter what, how I react to this situation, be it appropriate, you know, it's not going to, you know, take away from who I am at all, no matter what, what the end result of this is. And then we make much better decisions. It's the, the same thing in, uh, in poker. Um, all of a sudden you make a decision, you take a bad beat because you had the high, you, be you believed you had the highest probability and the lowest probability is what happened. So you lost the hand and maybe got knocked out of a tournament. Well, you made the decisions that you knew were the right decisions, and therefore it doesn't have any effect on who we believe we are. That's high self-esteem, and that allows us to come back the next day for the next trade, for the next opportunity in the market, for the next tournament. A lot of similarities when you look at that. Another one is flexibility. So how easy do we adapt to the changing conditions? Boy, that's uh, in, the, in the stock market, that's a real tough one. Lots of people that write to me have not adapted to the momentum market we've been in. Even I, after 43 years, have struggled with adapting to the momentum market. It is a massive challenge when you get into an anomaly situation, uh, and uh, it still means that you, it, to be successful, you have to do your best to adapt, adjust strategies, adjust the risk parameters uh, to fit uh, the market conditions. It's you know operating in the nature of the market that we have right now. Uh, it's adjusting when your trading is off uh, to the risk you take, to the strategies you take. It's the same thing in trading in playing poker. I recently had a seven game losing streak in poker and backed off quite a bit. It took a couple of weeks off where I didn't play and try to evaluate well, what was going on for me. And I've since broken that losing streak and had a couple of wins right in a row. So, um, you know, it's I knew that it would happen, and it's an anomaly that I would lose seven games in a row because I'm a pretty decent player. So it does happen, and you can lose seven trades in a row. You can lose seven trades in a row that have a you know two to one uh, risk of of uh, profit in a trade and still losing them seven times in a row. So we have to be you know have, be flexible to adjust to conditions like that that happen happen. Next thing is uh, trade is confidence. Um, uh, traders uh, that are confident uh, and poker players that are confident uh, evaluate data quickly. They make fast decisions. They uh, are they're they're confident that their instinctiveness is based on their historical knowledge gathering, and then when they feel it, they go with it. That's an intuitive process that comes up when we're when we have confidence. Um, our re, re, our reactions are appropriate. We don't go into this uh, analysis paralysis uh, situation where we're really slow to make decisions. That's a good 
traders don't do that. Good poker players don't do that. And if they do that, then you know that they're indecisive, and all of a sudden somebody will say, clock, and that means that the dealer is now giving them like one minute to make a decision because they, they, they can't, they're having trouble evaluating the uh, conditions uh, of that hand uh, at that time. So that, that tends to be a weakness. Uh, and it's okay to take you know time at certain times, but basically um, uh, we want to make sure that our decision making uh, is based on uh, our our knowledge, our intuition, and uh, being confident that those things overall will bring a positive return. The other side of that is impulsiveness, and that is. Um, reacting very quickly to everything because uh, there's part of us that needs to show that we can do that and uh, it means taking excessive risk often uh, in trading uh, and being impulsive uh, adding to bad positions uh, and uh, taking excessive risk and the same thing happens for poker players they've got a crappy hand uh, they uh, think that they can put a bluff out there uh, when their play has been really weak and there are really strong players at the table and all all of a sudden they find themselves out of a tournament or out of money and putting pulling in more money out of their pocket in a cash game so there's uh, it's important to act in confidence if you believe your intuitive uh, process uh, and uh, let yourself evaluate for relatively quick decisions the other side of that is good traders also have patience. So how do you do both? I mean, how do you have um, uh, the ability to react quickly and be patient? Well, when you're patient, you're evaluating situations, right? You're taking the time to really look at what the highest odds situation is, what the, what the market conditions are, uh, and if that evaluation goes quick and we our intuitive process clicks in, then we can make fast decisions. If it turns out that you know nothing is clear, you might make a fast decision to do nothing. See how that works? You can take the time to evaluate and be patient to do so for the highest probabilities, but then the decision making is rather quick once your evaluation process uh, has gone on in a healthy way. Uh, uh, the The next thing is 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 so you is, is so common to both it's unbelievable and that is that you're not subject to the risk of gambling poker play poker playing is a skill uh, there, there there is a luck aspect to poker just like there's a luck aspect to everything you put on a a, a trade that you think you've got a three to one positive risk reward but something happens like a uh, a news announcement comes out and you get blindsided and that's bad luck but you had a three to one risk reward and chances are three times versus one that you're probably going to make money on it so there's a luck part of it involved but when you um, if, when things go wrong and then you start betting money to get losses back without the intellectual process going on that is gambling it's the same thing that goes on in poker you know when you when you're when you're um, betting in a low odd situation uh, where you haven't set up a bluff proper properly uh, or you um, you're playing a uh, uh, hands that are um, likely to knock you out of a game because you're your stack is relatively low and your emotional reaction is coming up, then you're setting yourself up and you're gambling in order to do that. So the, the, there are certain times in poker where you take more risk based on all of the situation, but it's not gambling. It's a calculated risk. It's exactly the same when you are playing uh, uh, poker and when you are trading in the markets. And the last part of this is um, that uh, they control their, traders control their trading approach. They stay in their plan. Uh, and uh, that's what successful traders do. They, th their plan may have built in there that you know they do certain things when there's volatile markets. They do something things certain things when there are quiet markets. There are certain um, styles, they uh, strategies they use in one market, strategies they use in another market. They stay in the plan. And good good successful poker players do the same thing. They have a plan of how they're going to approach a tournament. Let's say as to 
how they'll play early in the tournament, how they'll play later in the tournament, the way they'll try to build their stack and the way aggressiveness they'll have based on different stages of the tournament, more aggressive or less aggressive, more aggressive or less aggressive based on, mar on, on market conditions, more aggressive, less aggressive based on the conditions that exist within that particular poker table. So there is uh, a lot of uh, similarities to that also. The last discussion we're going to have in here is about that one that annoys me, and that is uh, understanding true pot odds. Uh, so this is a, an interesting uh, discussion. Uh, we've got a, 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 It's a little bit longer than some of these other ones I've discussed, but I think a, a very important uh, discussion, understanding the true pot odds. So some kind of sell the idea that because a market has gone in one direction for an extended period of time that the odds are high that there will be a reversal. Some say even though that you have losses that that you get, you know, pot odds by staying in the market because odds favor a reversal. So those are two different things. One is because the market's gone a certain length of time that odds favor a reversal. One is because you have a specific amount of money that you have lost in the market that your odds are higher that there will be a reversal and you get money back uh, in the market. Two different things, uh, almost uh, the same uh, problem in understanding pot odds that gets you and it can get you in a lot of trouble. True pot odds are evaluated by numbers that you know or by numbers that you have a very, very good sense that you can know uh, in, in poker. In other words, uh, if you know how much money is in front of your opponent, you know that that's, you know, if you're playing in a heads up situation, that's the most of money he can, the most amount of money that opponent can bet. And therefore, that's the most amount of money that you could lose in that situation. So, you know, basically, when you're when you're figuring true pot odds, you basically do know all of the numbers. True pot odds are evaluated by the amount that you have to put in the pot in your next bet. That's important because we talked about people staying in positions because of how much money they've lost, right? And that there might be a reversal. True pot odds are evaluated by how much money you have to put in in your next bet versus the amount of money in the pot now or that you can calculate may likely be in the pot. We call that EV or expected value. Um, so it has nothing to do with the amount of money that you have put in the pot up till that level. So that's a, a, a very important distinction. I'll give you an example. Let's say that um, there's $100 in the pot. My opponent bets $50 to me, and we've seen the flop, so there are two more cards yet to come. I look and I have a suited hand that can also make a straight and there are two of the suit on the flop so there's a four flush and a four straight I need one of my suit for a flush or I need one of my suit for a straight one of my uh, hands for a straight and an open and open and straight I believe that if I catch either the suited card to make the flush or I make the straight that I, the likelihood is extremely high that I will have the winning hand. Especially if he's been an aggressive better from the beginning and I can evaluate he might have a high pair uh, or he might have uh, ace-king or ace-queen and, and maybe has, has caught a high pair, one pair. So th there's pretty good odds that if I catch the straight or the flush, I'm going to win. I mean, it's probably above 90%. I can figure that. I can also figure that I have two chances to hit my straight or flush, the turn, the fourth card, or the river, the fifth card. The, there are 17 cards in the deck, eight uh, suited cards, uh, I'm sorry, nine suited cards, and uh, I have an open end straight, so there are uh, eight cards that can make my straight, a total of 17 cards that will give me a chance to win. But there are two tries at it because there are two more cards coming. So I have 34 possibilities to win of the 47 cards I didn't see.
I have a 78% probability of hitting my straight or my flush based on that. Well, the opponent bet all of his money into me, $50. Now, I have, if there's $100 in the pot and he bets $50, so now there's $150 in the pot. I have to put in $50. I'm getting basically, you know, two to one on my money. Uh, $50 is three to one on my money, right? But I have a 78% prob probability of hitting the hand. So I have a statistical advantage in that hand. Now that may sound a little complicated, but that's figuring out true pot odds in the hand. You know, if, if it turns out that the hand was much bigger and I would have to risk my entire tournament, in other words, put all my money in, not get great bot odds, I might not risk all my capital. In fact, there are situations where, let's say I have a small pair and I think a guy has you know ace king or ace queen I have an 11 to 10 probability of winning the hand however if I have to put all my money in and I lose the hand on essentially near coin flip then I'm out of the tournament it may I might have a statistical advantage but I may choose not to take it because it takes me out of the hand out of the tournament so there are there's many many calculations that are real in in figuring out pot odds the the important part of that not taking that 11 to 10 situation is about preservation. I've decided I was going to preserve my capital, wait for a higher odds situation where I could double or triple up and get back in the tournament and get the money. So I'm making, I'm evaluating the conditions, my conditions, the conditions of, the, uh, of me in the tournament at the time and, and about preservation. This is very different than um, a fading momentum and guessing that there's going to be a reversal in the market and saying that I, you know, the market's gone up, you know, for 47 day, days without having a 1% move, 257 days and not having a 3% correction. So that justifies me being short and getting run over by the market because and losing more than I wanted to long ago and now adding to those losses because the odds are that at some point there's going to be a reversal. And that's what I hear a lot uh, on other networks and why I think it's so important to bring that up. Now, I, the, your eyes might have glassed over when I was going over those statistics about poker. But the important lesson to learn is that um, is that there's no edge in being short today because the market went up yesterday uh, or, or the market went up 10 days in a row. The edge is about your plan. The edge is about um, the uh, way that you um, manage your own money and protect your own losses and preserve your own capital. Um, and when the market uh, conditions change or when the conditions change at the poker table, and uh, things become advantageous to be in the direction that you want to be. It might be being on the short side right now. The, the, the market will make it clear to you that that's the case. You don't have to be short at the top uh, and believe that you have pot odds because the market's done something for such a long period of time. You can get yourself into a pot odd situation when you have momentum going your way as it's been on the upside for a long period of time. So uh, I say to you, uh, don't uh, believe in the false uh, purveyors of staying short in a rampaging market situation under the guise of pot odds. Th that is simply wrong, and those people that say it simply don't understand. So that is the um, comparisons between being a trader and being a poker player. I would guess that you found it interesting. I would guess that there are things in there that might be uh, valuable enough that are tweaks to your style, uh, things that you haven't considered, things that you haven't done uh, yet to improve your probability of success overall in the market. And uh, if there was a major aha for you in what I just shared, um, let me know. It might be an aha in um, your trading and things that you're going to um, you know, do differently in your approach. And it might be an aha in your poker playing. And uh, if that's the case, well, then I know that I brought value to you in something.
that's it uh, in uh, style, strategy, and plan, comparing trading and poker playing. And I'll see you in the next segment.